from Kona to Yanan, The Political Memoirs of Koji Ariyoshi, Chapter 12, Re-Education and Sanzo Nasaka. I had an intense schedule of work in the fall of 1944, for I planned to remain in the communist-led areas of China for only a month to observe the prisoner of war re-education and the psychological warfare the POW converts conducted. The Japanese national who undoubtedly contributed most in the war against Japanese militarism is Sanzo Nasaka. Even before I met him in the late fall of 1944 in Yan'an, I had heard American officials say that the Japanese militarists would sacrifice a division merely to get him. Time and again the Japanese military intelligence in China used spies in attempts to destroy this man, who then went under the name of Suzumu Akano, but they never succeeded. On the day I was supposed to meet him, I crossed a narrow footbridge over the Yin River from our side of the valley and headed toward the hill on the other side where the Chinese Communist-led 18th Group Army Headquarters was located. Accompanying me was a State Department official who was interested in finding out from Nasaka the extent of anti-militarist resistance in Japan and in China. Our first meeting with Nasaka took place in the 18th Army Group Headquarters. It was late fall and the ground was frozen, and in the cave the Chinese used charcoal braziers for heating purposes. We waited a while and on the hard ground we heard footsteps. Nasaka came in alone. He had a firm face with soft eyes, and as we shook hands, I felt an air of reserve about him, but definite warmth in him. He stood about five feet three inches and was of medium build. With our brief exchange of greetings over, he asked us if we had prepared a program for conducting our survey of his psychological warfare work and prisoner re-education. We handed him our schedule which indicated that I was limited to one month's assignment in Yan'an. He handed us his suggested outline, drawn up in much detail. We were a little surprised by his thorough preparation for this meeting with us. In subsequent contacts with him we learned that this was a habit with him, and he always urged us to prepare for our discussions as thoroughly as we could so that our time would be spent more fruitfully. He was a soft-spoken man with an easy smile. He quickly impressed me as a strong, dedicated person. His fight against the Japanese militarists had involved deadly risks of underground work in and around Japan. He escaped from Japan in 1930 or 1931. Practically all his colleagues in the Communist Party leadership were in prison. The Japanese communists were the most militant foes of rising sun militarism. And just as it happened in Hitler's Germany and Mussolini's Italy, the communists in Japan were the first to suffer repression. As our ally, we stood to benefit by our contact with him. A State Department expert on Japanese affairs once told me that Nasaka, more than anyone else, knew of occurrences in Japan and could interpret events and changing conditions in the enemy territory quite accurately. To orient himself, he had underground contacts with occupied territory in China, and through these sources he acquired information about Japan. Furthermore, he had a so-called publications buying chain which gathered all kinds of Japanese periodicals and books issued in Japan. They were bought in occupied China by his agents from Japanese officials, businessmen and professionals. Once or twice a month saddle loads of publications were brought into Yan'an and delivered to Nasaka by the Chinese. This was a risky undertaking all the way through. Japanese publications, particularly on economics and technical subjects, were sent to a few high-ranking civilians and officials, and to buy or to acquire this material from them regularly week after week or month after month required a great deal of planning. The Japanese officials themselves would become suspect if they were caught passing on some of their literature. Then the transportation of the material out of Japanese-occupied cities and across heavily guarded railway lines and through checkpoints involved further risks. I remember twice the Japanese crushed the buying chain in the Saka and the Chinese communists had to organize an entirely new channel. I knew this because we Americans had requested Nasaka and the Chinese to collect an extra set of Japanese publications for us so that we could send them to the translating and intelligence centers in Washington. This they did for us, although it involved dangers. When the agents were captured by the Japanese, Nasaka explained to me that we had to wait a while until he organized new contacts and underground connections. At one time we set up a microfilming center in Yan'an to photograph all Japanese publications in Nasaka's cave library. We visited his library on the first day we met him. In one section he had his card files kept in small cabinet boxes made from stiff cardboard. These boxes were kept in rows and square holes dug in the walls of the cave. Nasaka read and marked the Japanese publications that were brought to him in Yan'an. His librarian cross-indexed the contents. In this manner he followed events in Japan very closely, and as my assignment in Yan'an was extended, I was to interview him frequently on various questions pertaining to Japan. The headquarters frequently wanted to know what Nasaka's interpretation was on certain happenings in Japan, or wanted him to give us background and new information on various subjects. I would contact him immediately and generally he made an extensive study in his library. 
The interviews lasted from an hour to two hours, and after that I returned to my cave to write my reports from the notes I had taken. Several times I received phone calls from him late at night on the day of an interview, or early the following morning. He would ask me to delete certain phrases he had used or to substitute a word or a clause for ones he had used. Once when he wanted to make several changes, I asked him to wait until I got a pencil and paper and my notes. I did not think he had used a certain phrase. He told me over the field telephone the approximate page number of my notes on which I had written the phrase. I checked up and found that he was correct. Once I asked him how he remembered these details. Every night before I fall asleep, I review everything I have done or said during the day, he explained. This self-examination is very essential. It makes a person more responsible and develops him into a conscious and sincere worker. There was a time when Nasaka was orienting a State Department official and me on a project he was then conducting in his anti-Japanese militarist psychological warfare. He gave his information to us in Audian form, without benefit of notes. It was a typical outline, using a, then one, then a, etc. He would pause and discuss the various points and continue from where he had stopped. After dictating for about six pages, he would give us the guide when we lost track of our letters and numbers because of digressing discussions. Now, we are on small under two of big G. All of us were bilingual, speaking and writing both English and Japanese. Thus we did not have difficulty in communicating with Nasaka. When his converted prisoners of war who were teachers at the Japanese peasants and workers school joined in our discussions, we carried on conversations in Japanese only. The prisoner converts were well trained. They published their own news bulletins and issued anti-militarist leaflets which were used on the front lines. We Americans wanted their criticism of our leaflets produced in Chungking and on the Burma front because we wanted to improve our propaganda material. I took samples to them and sat with Nasaka's staff around a table and took notes as they gave their evaluation OFR leaflets. The criticisms and suggestions were well taken by our psychological warfare units in Chungking and Burma. They in turn sent out copies of the evaluations to psychological warfare units in Honolulu, Saipan, Washington, and later in the Philippines. The suggestions prepared by the prisoner converts proved helpful, and from all of these places I began receiving samples of leaflets dropped over Japanese lines and in Japan, asking that they be evaluated and criticized by the prisoner converts. I was also asked to have Nasaka's propagandists listen to OWI broadcasts beamed to Japan and to get their reaction. In the same manner that they criticized and made suggestions to improve our leaflets, they listened to radio programs and then held long evaluation sessions. On many occasions I asked the prisoner converts about their post-war outlook. They said they were returning to Japan to reconstruct the defeated nation along democratic lines. They said they hoped that the wartime cooperation OF the major powers would continue and that we all would work together on a common ground and with a common purpose to make Japan a peaceful nation. I do not know what these men are doing today, nor what they think of us. Nasaka returned to Japan in 1945 after the surrender, and news accounts said that on his arrival, the welcome given him along the railway on which he traveled was unprecedented. He was a hero in a defeated Japan, where people wanted peace. He was later elected to the parliament along with some others of his party who had spent more than 18 years in prison. But with the resurgence of militarism in Japan, where war criminals are being freed to remilitarize the nation, he has again been driven underground. A few days after I arrived in Yanan, Sanzo Nasaka took me and a State Department official to the headquarters of the Japanese Workers and Peasants School and to the headquarters of the Japanese People's Emancipation League. The students and members of the League were prisoners of war who had been converted against Japanese militarism. They were living normal lives without guards, owned a cooperative store in Yanan, produced food and spun cotton to partly pay their expenses. They lived better than the Chinese soldiers, and the soldiers and government officials told me that good treatment was essential to helping them turn away from militarism and prepare them for a life in post-war, democratic Japan. Furthermore, they said the Japanese standard of living was higher, and so they were used to better food than the Chinese. As we walked to the headquarters, halfway up the hill with an ancient pagoda perched on its top, a group of Japanese dressed in faded blue, homespun uniforms, putties and rope sandals like those of the 18th Group Army, met us. These men were cadres, re-educated prisoners of war who were now teachers and officials of the school, and the Japanese People's Emancipation League, an anti-Japanese militarist organization. Only one was not a POW. He was Jun Sawada, a veteran communist from Japan, who had smuggled himself into North China in 1943 after his release from prison. We came to a patio which was a deep terrace cut into the hillside. 
on the face of the cliff which was cut perpendicularly were dozens of caves tunneled into the hillside pieces of paper with drawings and writings were tacked up on the lowest wall with tiny wooden pegs there was an article criticizing lazy students who did not take study and production for self-efficiency seriously i read several news commentaries on the pacific and european wars there was a long editorial exposing the emperor myth all had been written by students none of the pow's was referred to as a prisoner all were students this was the policy of the chinese communists a group of students came out of a cave and saluted nasaka these were new students who had recently fallen captive and been sent to the rear for re-education nasaka spoke informally and softly to the new students and i took notes he said you are undergoing a very difficult period of readjustment when you were captured some of you must have considered suicide because of disgrace let me tell you that it is not a shame to fall into an antagonist's hands rather it is a great loss if you do not live to serve in rebuilding a new japan consider that all of you have died once then you have nothing to lose you must inject new spirit and thinking into yourselves if you do this it will be in your power to realize the impossible we do not coerce you you are free to think for yourselves but i ask you to cast away your prejudices against us and objectively examine and study what we have to say and offer you may agree or disagree that is up to you the school was divided into three sections a for beginners b for intermediate and c for advanced students the full course nominally took one year but actually students never stopped studying we attended a lecture held in a mud-walled thatched auditorium the students who marched into classrooms carried crudely made low wooden stools the lecturer was a husky bull-necked former corporal in the japanese army a graduate of tokyo's kokushiken semen gakko which centered its education around the code of bushido he had once taught jiu-jitsu at the osaka police department he was teaching marxism at yanon in simple terms so that the most backward student could understand his course on political common sense included lectures on wage price and commodities the role of labor nature of feudalism and capitalism and so on the majority of these students some in their late thirties and early forties were peasants and workers i noticed that some could hardly read or write well enough to carry on their studies i was surprised to see them sitting there in an ill-lighted hall each with a piece of writing board on his lap painfully scribbling in his notebook i returned to the school almost every day to talk to students study their attitudes and see how much of this new teaching they absorb the students took for granted that one day they would return to japan this was a big morale point and motivated their efforts at night i observed other study groups where students discussed the subject matter of the day's lectures new students generally repeated by rote the more advanced students showed greater independent thinking one night i heard fifteen students discuss economic exploitation in japan in terms of their own experiences they strove to show how as farmers laborers and tradesmen they had been squeezed by landlords and capitalists because of their past experiences i found that laborers and farmers grasped their lessons much faster than intellectuals it soon became evident that there was a lot more to this project that changed the japanese soldiers who had been imbued with the teachings of bushido i talked to the chinese communist psychological warfare specialists and to americans of our observer section who returned from guerrilla bases far behind japanese lines all of them gave me the same story on chinese prisoner treatment and later as my stay in north china was extended i was able to verify these earlier accounts given me we cannot succeed with prisoner re-education without the basic policy and support of the chinese communists misaka told me their policy and our policy is preferential treatment of prisoners he said that from the moment of capture or surrender the prisoners were given good treatment this initial approach is necessary in the case of all prisoners even those who were set free and allowed to go back to their units in the initial period out of two thousand four hundred seven prisoners the communist troops kept only three hundred twenty two the pow's were returned after a short anti-war indoctrination because the chinese had no facilities at that time to re-educate all the captives there was a serious problem of the vengeance and bitterness of the chinese peasants who suffered from the japanese three all policy of killing looting and burning villages were systematically destroyed chinese civilians beat or tortured to death any stray japanese they caught the communist soldiers escorted the captives to rear area headquarters where japanese speaking personnel handled the pow's even the local guerrillas preferred to see a dead japanese to a live one the peasants took the brunt of japanese brutality and bestiality and had only hate for the enemy without their support however it was realized the prisoner re-education project would fail nasaka told me that it was difficult to keep the peasants spirit of resistance and at the same time teach them to be kind to captives a mass campaign to orient millions of peasants was launched in north china and political workers from the army and guerrilla area governments were then assigned the task of convincing the peasants that their main enemies were the japanese fascist militarists who had deceived their people 
Once captured, the soldiers can be re-educated to fight the common enemy. I met two old-timers among the 322 POWs who had been kept for re-education. In 1938 they had been selected to go from village to village with Chinese co-workers to explain to the peasants that disarmed Japanese soldiers were potential friends and allies of the Chinese people. This was in 1938. By 1944, the peasants were leading stray captives to headquarters. They treated them well. Old-timers among Japanese POW converts and Chinese communist-led areas used to tell me that during the early years of the Sino-Japanese War, a stray Japanese captive was apt to be lynched or tortured to death by angry mobs of peasants. I asked them questions in great detail. I was then, in the late fall of 1944, making a survey of Chinese psychological warfare and the prisoner re-education program. The Chinese took revenge, they told me, because of the death and destruction the Japanese invaders perpetrated in village after village. But the Chinese communists early decided that such retaliation was detrimental to the re-education of Japanese prisoners. Preferential treatment of POWs from the moment of capture was considered essential to facilitate re-education. I had several long sessions on this question with the political department officials of the Chinese Communist-led 18th Group Army, amalgamation of the 8th Route and the new 4th Armies, who told me that all available personnel was used to orient millions of peasants in liberated areas and in new guerrilla bases behind Japanese lines. The peasants were told that the Japanese soldiers were potential allies once they dropped their guns. Re-educated, they would be on their side. The task of educating millions of peasants under war conditions when they were taking the brunt of Japanese punitive and raiding expeditions can be appreciated when we consider the strong anti-Japanese feeling that still prevails in the Philippines. More than a year ago in Manila, a South Korean diplomatic official was beaten up because he was mistaken for a Japanese. After long efforts, we succeeded in our persuasion. Lai Chu Lai, former head of the anti-Japanese militarist psychological warfare work told me, for several years now the peasants have been apprehending escaped captives and spies and sending them back to headquarters. Peasants are vigilant and we do not use guards in rear areas to watch over prisoners. But we had other difficulties, Mr. Lai said, and these were posed by the students. Mr. Lai, who had studied in Japan and handled Japanese very well, said that the captives brought all their prejudices with them. They looked down upon the Chinese as an inferior people. In addition to this, the poor living standards in the guerrilla areas made the captives complain about food although they received better rations than the Chinese communist soldiers themselves. At the earliest stage of the prisoner re-education program, the POWs, who were called students in Yan'an, refused to study. They slept all day and sold their school supplies to get additional spending money, Mr. Lai said, and some would not even get up to wash their faces. By the time Sanzo Nasaka, the Japanese communist, arrived in Yan'an in the early 40s and took over Mr. Lai's responsibilities, the students were cooperating. But another problem confronted the prisoner conversion project, and that was the infiltration of spies from the Japanese army into the Japanese workers' and peasants' school and the Japanese People's Emancipation League. Some confessed later, after months of re-education, that they were sent into the guerrilla areas with instructions to assassinate Nasaka. My next step in the survey of prisoner re-education was the observation of student attitudes and the methods used in the school to remold them. I sat down one day with Suzumu Takeyama, a prisoner convert himself, who was superintendent of the school. We went over the curriculum, discussed the lectures and group discussions, and came to self-criticism. I told Mr. Takeyama that I wanted to sit in at one session at least. He looked at his calendar and gave me a date. We must thoroughly remold an individual, he said to me. At least we try to. Tutoring alone is not enough, he explained. Changing oneself is extremely difficult, and this requires outside assistance. Group endeavor and mass pressure are therefore important. What is self-criticism? I asked the superintendent, and this was his explanation. Criticism is the mirror by which the students see themselves inside and out. It reflects their good and bad points. Criticism among new students is mild, among advanced students, on a higher plane. For the new captives, self-criticism is difficult to understand, he said, for they believe in on May, fate, unquestioning acceptance, and they are so accustomed to domineering leadership and blind following. Freedom of expression is a new experience to them. Public ceremony and face-saving methods, which Takeyama labeled as the characteristic behavior of a feudal society, hampered self-criticism, he said. One night I went to observe self-criticism sessions. The cave I entered was dimly lighted by a small, chimneyless lamp. There were about twenty of us, and about a dozen crowded around two charcoal braziers to warm their hands. The chairman and the secretary sat at a table. The first to be criticized, a student in his mid-thirties, moved his stool up to the table. 
he was a section leader in charge of students living in three caves as he began his self-criticism eyes stared at him from smoke-filled recesses of the cave it has been pointed out to me in previous criticism that i am conceited and do not mix with others he began i know i am egotistical and individualistic i am now studying hard but lately i have not been using my syllabus and notes therefore others may think i am not studying he covered a broad ground and finally when he stopped the chairman asked for criticism there was an apparent hesitancy and as the students meditated shadows from the flickering lamp played on the wall first to volunteer was a student somewhere in a dark corner he said the section leader had not improved a bit since coming to yanan although he had been given a responsible position the next student said you once said this school is like a prison now tell us what you meant by this the chairman whose face was flushed red by lamplight asked for an answer the section leader said he had mentioned it as a joke two students immediately corrected him for telling such a joke and the section leader accepted the criticism as the session continued i was impressed by the fact that here in this cold and dark cave human attitudes and thinking were being remolded it was unlike anything i had seen the atmosphere was charged with the seriousness of this earnest group of men searching for truth their past was dead so they felt the japanese army had sent ashes to their homes and their families were mourning for them a student criticized the section leader for reminiscing about good times he had had in japan about tea-house ladies who had poured him rice wine etc he said this shows our section leader is confused in his thinking he cannot serve a new japan not with his approach to problems another student wanted to know why the section leader lived in his past the answer was to boost the morale of students in his section at this he was asked point blank do stories of prostitutes and drinking boost our morale and so the discussion went on into the night taking into account the section leader's political thinking expressions and daily conduct in the bitterly cold cave the frosty air spurred it from the mouths of students as like old testament prophets they belabored their colleagues weaknesses a towering shadow leaped on a wall as the chairman rose to summarize the criticism the section leader took copious notes blowing his breath on his hand to keep it warm i am only human he said it is impossible to reform overnight but i will do my utmost from tomorrow here several colleagues raised their voices and suggested that he change not tomorrow but from this very minute at least they asked that such an attitude be adopted another section leader was brought up for criticism on pagoda hill that night five other criticism meetings were going on some were more theoretical and probing while others of new students like the one i first observed were more elementary personal and superficial i visited a few each time stepping out of the serene chinese night into a smoky cubicle where confused men of japan crouched seeking the truth in themselves if only a glimmer as small as the glow of the light around which they collected i came back to the first meeting in time to hear superintendent takeyama who had sat through the meeting give his views of the night session he thought the criticisms far from satisfactory poor in quality and content for students who had been in school for almost half a year then he concluded touchingly all of us have died once most of the students stared at the dark ground a few upturned faces near the table glowed red and shadows played on their faces takeyama continued we are now building the foundations of our new lives we have made mistakes as soldiers of aggressive militarism which we cannot afford to repeat if bad points crop up they should be erased through self-criticism and criticism by others must be given in good faith constructively and not destructively each and every one must help the other those who are criticized must improve from that minute at least that should be the attitude we must not only remold ourselves but we must be vanguards to change the militaristic japan into a democratic people's country the session over i walked out of the cave and down the steep hillside and over the frozen ground back to my cave in the u s army observer section to type my notes while my observations were fresh beyond the hill with caves which were the living quarters classrooms and offices of the prisoner converts was a valley occupied by korean patriots who had their school and their independence league the leaders of the korean league were veterans of the independence movement fighting the japanese subjugators from the underground of cities in korea manchuria and china some had joined the guerrilla forces in manchuria beginning with the late nineteen twenties to attack the japanese forces ruling korea here too like the japanese organization the majority were prisoner converts within the extensive borders of china korean political groups fought for national independence against the japanese and nurtured their forces for post-war activities in their native country the korean provisional government group maintained its headquarters in wartime chongqing receiving board and lodging from chiang kai-shek's government this group was led by kim ku and its titular head was singman ri who was lobbying in Washington that his group would be put in the saddle of the post-war Korean government. Kim Yak-san, a factional leader in the provisional government whom I came to know quite well in 1944, told me that, 
like the Chinese nationalists. His provisional government force was not fighting the Japanese. Kaji Wataru, the anti-fascist Japanese writer, who was having supper with us in a small restaurant in Chongqing, remarked that the provisional government looked good on paper, and like the Japanese POWs whom Kaji had once re-educated and used against the enemy, and who were now held in custody because Chiang was not fighting, the Koreans were showpieces for Chiang. Kim said that the provisional government had no liaison with Japanese-occupied Korea and he did not know how the Korean people would receive it after the war. Kaji said that for Chang, the supporting of the provisional government in Chongqing provided him with a strong lever in Washington to get backing for his regime. Chang's representatives would push the idea of a nationalist China allied with Ri's Korea, both banking on anti-communism to survive, working closely with the United States. In North China, in the territory under the Yan'an administration, the Korean Independence League functioned actively, fighting the Japanese on the war fronts. The League had its headquarters in Yan'an. Like the Japanese POWs under Sanzo Nasaka, the Koreans carried on intensive anti-Japanese militarist psychological warfare. Not being POWs, Korean League members participated in guerrilla warfare. The Korean Independence League was located about four miles from our U.S. Army Observer Section, and once or twice a week I went there on foot. I met Chinese and Korean generals and officers from Japanese-occupied Manchuria, where the Koreans, with the support of Chinese communists, had carried on guerrilla warfare since the early 1930s against the Japanese. In the cave headquarters of the Independence League I met underground agents from Korea who traveled about a couple of thousand miles on foot and by rail into Yan'an, eluding the Japanese intelligence network and police system. We learned about Korea from them and about the Japanese. The efficiency of the underground was remarkable and they helped our war effort. Koreans from Manchuria and Korea told me of Kim Il-sung and of college students in North Korea going into the mountains to join the guerrilla leaders in their independence struggle. There were these resistance groups of Koreans in China. Peace in a coalition government in China certainly would have influenced the politics in post-war Korea. But when the war ended, Chiang, with U.S. support, rushed the provisional government into Korea. The political and military personnel of the Korean guerrilla forces in Manchuria also returned to their homeland. From Yan'an, I saw the Korean Independence League members begin their march northeastward, 1,500 miles or more to their homes from which the Japanese had exiled them because of their patriotic independence fight. The Koreans from the north and south formed a coalition People's Republic in Seoul, and the provisional government elements were unable to sit in the saddle. Then, about a month after Japanese capitulation, Lieutenant General John R. Hodge arrived in Korea as military governor of South Korea, outlawed the existing People's Republic, and prohibited any South Korean political group from participating in it. This made it possible for Ri, who was brought back to Korea from Washington, to grab power. As I walked to and from the cave headquarters of these organizations every day, I had ample opportunity to watch the Chinese people going about naturally and performing their everyday activities. Sometimes, walking all alone on the valley floor, I felt the strange absence of voices calling Hi, Joe, and the sight of grinning souvenir vendors or pimps who followed GIs in India and in nationalist China. No one in Yan'an offered to buy GI cigarettes or lighters or chocolate. There were no money changers. This was because of the non-existence of a black market. This indifference of the Chinese populace towards Americans, who received overwhelming attention from the poor in India and nationalist China, made a strong impression on me through an unforgettable incident. It happened about a week after my trip into Yan'an. A State Department official and I were returning from the school for Japanese. From the caves where we had spent the day, we walked down into the valley. When I tried to ride my horse, the saddle slipped under his belly, since a well-meaning Chinese had loosened the belts of our hitched horses. My horse began kicking. This agitated the other horse. When the State Department official mounted his horse, it started off at a trot. He yelled, whoa, whoa, and yanked the bridle with all his might. His horse ran faster and faster and broke into a gallop. He jumped off, rolling in the dust, and miraculously escaped injury. A Chinese caught the runaway horse and rode back to us. His riding form was most unusual. He leaned backward, pulling the bridle back with legs and stirrups stretched out front and outward. The horse trotted beautifully. The Chinese looked at the great big white man, wearing horn-rimmed glasses and covered with dust. In sign language and in his dialect, he tried to explain to us that the horse did not understand our riding habits. He demonstrated that to stop a horse, the rider had to yank only one side of the bridle to turn the horse's head clear around so that it could not see in front. We said to ourselves that these horses were broken in Mongolian fashion to trot at a fast pace. The Chinese interrupted us, pointing to his lips which gave off this sound, B-E-E, -E, B -E -E, and he made a sign that meant saying whoa, is wrong horse language. We thanked the man and we walked, leading our horses by their reins. We did not want to get thrown off. 
Although the American compound was only 20 minutes away, we could not find it by nightfall. We tramped around the narrow, barren valley for almost two hours. We stopped every Chinese on the road to ask for direction to our headquarters. We walked into an army garrison and into private compounds, but people did not seem to know what we wanted. We kept repeating over and over to everyone we met, Make you o gen tsi nari. Where are the Americans? Peasants and merchants laughed at us and finally we had to laugh with them. They spoke to us and asked questions in their dialect. We couldn't understand them so we walked on, thanking them, and they continued with whatever they were doing. In India or Kanaming, we said, we would be swarmed by people by this time, trying to do business with us, and they would know where the Americans lived. But here we were lost in a narrow valley because the people were not chasing after GI dollars. Finally a soldier guided us back to our compound. I was thoroughly tired and exasperated. That night after I had washed and finished supper, I recapitulated our experience. It became extremely humorous, the more I thought of it. I wrote it down in my diary as the second unique experience. The first was when the American colonel told the officers and men to unload their prophylactics because there were no prostitutes in Yan'an. Up to then my experience was that everywhere Americans went, the native people catered to them, making GIs feel they were the most important people, and taking their dollars which the soldiers squandered with a flourish. But here we had asked among the valley people, where are the Americans? For two solid hours and some had reacted as though to ask, are the Americans here? 